In times of crisis, designing an efficient policy response is paramount. In case of natural disaster or pandemics, it can even determine the difference between life and death for a substantial number of people. But precisely, how do you design such policy responses, making sure that risks are optimally shared, that people feel safe enough to reveal necessary information, or that stakeholders commit to the policies? Well, that's where a field of economics, industrial organization, can help, as Shosh Wasserman will tell us in this episode. Shosh is an assistant professor of economics at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, Specialized in industrial organization, her interests span a number of policy settings, such as public procurement, pharmaceutical pricing, and auto insurance. Her work leverages theory, empirics, and modern computation, including the STAN software, to better understand the equilibrium implications of policies and proposals involving information revelation, risk sharing, and commitment. In short, Shoshana uses theory and data to study how risk, commitment, and information flows interplay with policy design. And she does a lot of this with Bayesian models. I hope you guessed it. Who said Bayes had no place in economics, right? Prior to Stanford, Shosh did her bachelor's in mathematics and economics at MIT, and then her PhD in economics at Harvard University. This was a fascinating conversation where I learned a lot about Bayesian inference on large-scale random utility logic models, about socioeconomics network heterogeneity, and about pandemic policy response. And I'm sure you will too. This is Learning Bayesian Statistics, episode 28, recorded July 28, 2020. Welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics, a fortnightly podcast on Bayesian inference, the methods, the project, and the people who make it possible. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country, and reach a true Bayesian state of mind by visiting learnbayesstats.anvil.app. That's learnbayesstats.anvil.app. Do you want to support the podcast and unlock exclusive patient swag at the same time? Then you can visit my Patreon page at patreon.com slash stats. Starting at $3, you can get various benefits like the private Learn Base Stats Slack channel, early access to special episodes, selecting questions for episodes, or even coming on the show. You'll get more details at patreon.com slash stats. Thanks a lot, guys. I'm very grateful for any support. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. What's a Bayesian? It's someone who cares about evidence and doesn't jump to assumptions based on intuitions and prejudice. A Bayesian makes predictions on the best available info and adjusts the probability because every belief is provisional. And when I kick a flow, mostly I'm watching eyes widen, maybe because my likeness lowers expectations of tight rhyming how would i know unless i'm rhyming in front of a bunch of blind men dropping placebo controlled science like i'm richard hello my favorite bayesians i hope you're all doing well and that you like the special episode about the u.s election we're now going back to the normal fortnightly frequency but before that, I'd like to thank my brand new supporters on Patreon, especially those in the full poster tier or higher. So, hats up to you, Larry Gill, Joshua Duncan, Jan Moran, and Paul Oreto. I'm sending you all my Bayesian wishes from Paris. And now, let's talk about industrial organization and policy design and response with Shosh Fasserman. Josh Wasserman, welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics. Thanks very much for having me. Happy to be here. I'm really happy to have you here. You're only the second economist, actually, to come on the show after almost 30 episodes. And actually, allow me, indulge me to do an economist joke. It seems like Bayesian economics are, economists are in short supply. It's so. very nice. <laughs> I'm really happy about this joke. It's because I'm not an economist, you know, so I don't get to use the lingo very often. No, know, supply so. and demand. I mean, this is how the economists really have reach. You don't hear about us very much, but you know what supply and demand means. So you're really always thinking about us implicitly. Okay, but before getting into the economics, we're going to talk about your background. Because from what I read preparing for the show, 
seems like you're into math and econ since at least your bachelor's degree. So how come? What's your story? Yeah, I mean, at least my bachelor's degree is pretty close, actually. I think most people I know have been doing it since they were five, or at least if you ask them, it sounds like that's not really the case for me. At least at the beginning of high school, I was very interested in history and political science, more even like mm. formal political theory. You know, I like to pretend to read philosophers and, and things like that. Mm. But I had an experience in my junior year of high school. I took a class at NYU, and that was a class in Russian literature, so nothing to do with math. But coincidentally, in the orientation for the program, I met a guy who convinced me to date him and then also somehow seemed to convince me to do math. A longer story there, but the short end of it is that I became more interested and I started taking more classes. A very influential class yeah. was a number theory class with Joel Spencer. And so by the time I got to MIT, I, I had this feeling that I might really like math and might be interested in it. Of course, I felt underqualified next to my Olympiad classmates, <laughs> but not too intimidated. And so the more I learned, the more I got interested in it. But I still had this sort of residual interest in all things political. And so I had this intuition without really knowing much about what economics is. I hadn't, you know, I, I read The Economist, but I don't remember if I thought that that's what economics was. But I had this idea that economics was where political science or political questions, at least, met with mathematical rigor. And so I had this idea that I like math and I like politics stuff. And so surely I'll like economics. Now, I don't really know what a regression is, but, you know, I'll find out. So I started taking classes. So I started my degree doing some math classes, but also taking some economics classes. And I had one level above this. I really don't remember where I got this idea, but I had this idea that because the thing that I was seeking in economics was where math met political theory and like formal political theory and the kind of stuff I read with philosophers, that it would be game theory, that this is where all of these would meet. So I had this idea that if I learned game theory, I would figure out if economics is really what I'm looking for. And so I took as many game theory classes as I could. I can sit for hours and tell you about all the people who had major influences on me and the path that I took. But somehow, I guess I decided that I was right enough. Mm. Of course, there's a second step that I'm guessing we'll get to soon, which is I did a lot of game theory in undergrad, but I don't really do a lot of pure game theory now. Of course, I do still do mm. some, but I guess there's one additional branch of the story, which is that when I got to grad school, I had this feeling that like game theory was very satisfying in the sense that it combined math and formal political theory, but somehow it wasn't really enough. I had this experience. I remember I worked on a paper in algorithmic game theory about how well you could do by trying to get drivers to follow directions given by a mediator. Essentially, how could you organize people to be more efficient in their driving routes, given that you can't lie to them, given that you have to give them directions that are incentive compatible, but you still want to organize them because you don't want to get traffic jams. You don't want to get something called a race paradox. And I wrote this nice paper and I went to present it at a conference. And I noticed that every time when I was explaining the paper, when I was giving the pitch, I explained it as though it was an empirical question. The reason that this is interesting is not because we care about graphs in terms of edges on a piece of paper, but because we care about the real world. And that seems to be the, mm -hmm. the lens that was the thing that was capturing me. And of course, every time I explained it to somebody at the conference, they'd be like, well, have you talked to Google? Have you talked to Waze? Are you doing this in real life? Mm -hmm. And I'd say, no, no, this is just theory. You know, I don't actually know anything about the real world. And it felt dissatisfying. And so I moved in a more empirical direction and I landed on this field where I get to do something that's sort of, for me at least, balances the two worlds. I get to use theoretical models to structure and discipline my understanding of the world, but then that's not where it stops. You know, the models basically inform the questions that I ask to real data and together I try to say something about the real world as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like this story. That's super interesting. And I think I can also see where Bayesian stuff and Bayesian workflow could be interesting in there because you have gradual understanding that you build with the data and then the model, then it informs again your understanding of the world and then you can refine the model. Super interesting. We're going to dive on that in an example of what you do and what you did. But I want to talk a bit about junction with game theory and then industrial organization and First, like maybe a personal question, because I like topics of political science related to math. So something I'm super interested in is elections, you know, but like the process of electing people. And you have a huge literature, as I'm sure, game theory for electing people in a, of course, I don't have the word in English now, but <laughs> the most efficient way found it, like Condorcet voting. And I think it's arrow theorem. And so I'm curious, did you work on that? Or if not, why? Is it only serendipity? Or are you planning to work on that? What's your take on that? 
I find election incredibly interesting. I also find it to be a difficult topic on which there's a lot of interesting work already happening. Mm. If I found a good angle to ask something that sort of fit my toolkit, I think I would try. But Mm -hmm. I think we'll talk a little bit more about the kinds of problems that I have worked on. The way that I get to problems is a lot of serendipity in many directions. And a lot of it is there are questions that itch at me that I have in the back of my head. And once in a while, I'll get an idea for how to answer them Mm -hmm. with data. And once I get an idea, then, you know, I start pitching it to people and I find somebody to work on it with, someone who would be fun and exciting. And then somehow, sometimes that turns into a, you know, a big project for many years and, and hopefully a paper. And so I hope that one day I have that experience with something revolving elections, but really there's no other reason. It just hasn't happened yet. Yeah, I see. So I hope someone working on election, guys, come work with Shosh on that. And if I were to work on these kind of topics, I think something that would depress me is that I'm really super pessimistic on the possibility to actually change the way elections are held today. Because as you said, we already have a lot of good literature on that. And we know that like the way we have elections, for instance, in France, you know, it's like two rounds of elections and it's been shown like mathematically that it's clearly not the optimal way to held election. And we have clearly better systems like majority judgment or randomized controversy voting, which are available and could be tested, but none of them are tested. And I'm like super pessimistic on the possibility of having that, you know, not only like nationwide, but just for like official elections, but small elections like at the scale of a city or else. So that would be something I'd be pessimistic about. But uh, I'm not sure I'd be as pessimistic as you are. I think people who are yeah. much, much more influential than me, like Eric Maskin, have been writing articles. I think, especially after 2016, there are some pretty influential, I think, opinion pieces pushing for runoff ballots, voting yeah. and things like that. And yeah. serious pushes by serious people who want to push for experimentation. And I think there is experimentation, at least in the US, on the local level. I'm cautious not to say something that's wrong, but I think there was serious discussion about using a more innovative election procedures in New York. And I think in Vermont, there has been for a while, you know, like the American political system is a very complicated beast Mm -hmm. with many pros and cons. But I think one of the big pros is there are very many different small systems and they do really use it to experiment. And so we might well find out, you know, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but maybe in the next 10 or 20 years. We might yeah. see a shift in what people think is acceptable and a good idea. And maybe it'll come because of these experiments. And yeah. then there'll be amazing data to analyze, right? The more people experiment, oh, yeah. the more we can actually try to, to say things about it. Yeah, yeah. That will be the time where you will be able to work on a project on that, <laughs> I'm guessing. I guess the other thing is that the theory of elections is, of course, very interesting. But as you point out, I am not sure that the low-hanging fruit in terms of what's really important for policy is how do you run an election You know, as you say, we already know a lot about what makes for better election systems than what we have. But it seems like a lot of the real problems we have are really about sort of practical mechanisms. How do you actually Mm -hmm. implement things, not at the level of incentives for the median voter or for a range of voters and extending their preferences, but just how do you make a system that's difficult to rig on a very practical level that you can't falsify votes for? How do you handle, you know, like this massive political problem in the U.S. right now is about managing paper ballots or in-person versus mail-in voting ballots, especially now with COVID. These are sort of huge issues and they're in some sense very mundane practical issues because in some sense we know how to use mail-in ballots. But on the other hand, as running a system is very complicated and involves incentives on a number of different levels, for example, there is a discrepancy between who manages these ballots and who's responsible for ascertaining them, right? Like in some sense, local municipalities and states are responsible for a lot of what goes on with voting, including in verifying that their voting system is legitimate and difficult to crack. But this voting goes into a national election. There's clearly a national interest. And there are so many different parties that are involved that I think that there's a lot of really interesting theory and probably a lot of really interesting data that could be very useful in understanding how to make elections better, even without this super high level philosophical question of can you do voting efficiently? Yeah, that's super interesting. I actually should do a, a whole podcast episode about that because that's fascinating. And I also love these topics. But just when I say to conclude and then move on to industrial organization, but I agree with what you're saying. And yeah, my prior 
would be there is more chance to see some experiments on these topics in the US because it's more decentralized than, for instance, in France, where the country is like super centralized and you also have these huge focus on equality, whatever that means. But I'm sure my prior would be that a lot of people would be shocked, you know, if you start doing experiments like in some region of the country which would elect what would be the governor in the US a different way than what we do, for instance, in Paris, you know. So definitely, I think more interesting experiments in the US. And as you said, there is already some experiments with ranking vote in New York and so on. So we'll see where it goes. That's super dynamic feel right now. Very interesting. But it's not why I invited you today. <laughs> Despite these topics being super interesting, I invited you because you work a lot on a field that's called industrial organization. So first, tell us what IO or industrial organization is and what are the main characteristics of the field compared to other fields in economics? Yeah, so it's funny that you said that's not why you invited me here, because I think one of the leading voices, certainly one of the most famous voices of IO historically, is Jean Tirole, who's worked a lot on voting theory and has had some very interesting theoretical work recently on exactly these kinds of questions. They're not entirely what you would call classical IO questions. Maybe you would think they're more political economy questions. But the truth is that I mean, it's difficult to define IO. I guess there's a history of it. And historically, the reason that it's called industrial organization is because it has focused on questions of firms, on mm. how supply and demand meet, how pricing mm. is done, and in particular on questions regarding antitrust. So when is there too much monopoly power so that we would like to curb it? For example, there are other kinds of questions but in practice, what it's become, especially as it's become a more empirical field, at least in, in my view, and I'm going to take sort of a brave stance in, in saying this, is that it's become a lot more synonymous with what we call structural methods in economics. And of course, the word structural means a lot of things in, in every part of statistics and in physics and whatnot. What it means in economics is basically what I mentioned before, combining theory as with statistics or using theory in order to help interpret and, and determine which statistics to look at. And that makes it pretty broad because if you look at the IO literature, so if you look, a good way to see what IO stands for is to look at the NBR IO program, which lists a lot of recent papers. The topics really are quite broad. It might seem that IO really studies basically any part of public policy, especially focusing on public policy, sometimes also on firm policy where there are a lot of different moving parts, there are different agents, and there's something like a market that you can study, something that mm. looks kind of that we can call some supply. Supply just means that somebody is, is setting incentives in some way, setting a price, setting a quantity, making some sort of restriction, and something called demand. Demand could be anything, it could be how much are people willing to pay for insurance or how much risk are they willing to take. That's a source of demand. As much as, you know, like what kind of toilet paper am I going to buy if my favorite brand on Amazon goes out of stock? So those are maybe the two classical examples, but you can then also talk about political theory in terms of supply and demand, right? Because now who are the suppliers? Well, maybe the suppliers are the politicians or the political organizations and the voters are demanding candidates and doing something that looks a lot like the kind of purchasing decision that we would think of as classical IO or really classical economics. So it's really quite broad. For me, the reason that I got into IO is exactly the reason that I told you before. I'm really interested in these policy questions. I guess the questions themselves have gotten more concrete. So less, you know, how do we build a political system and more, how do we design incentives so that local governments give us safe elections, for example. But the way that I tried to answer that question is by framing it as a market and using the idea that everything that what we observe is really an equilibrium outcome. People are sort of doing the best that they can to meet the circumstances that they're facing, and they're doing it at the same time. So you have multiple moving yeah. parts, and the way that you can interpret the different moving parts is in terms of economic equilibrium idea. Mm -hmm. And then when there's data to use together with that, then I can actually say something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds like a super interesting <laughs> field. And by the way, I will remember that you suggested me to invite Jean Tirole on the show. I will try. <laughs> I think you can make a strong case that there's a Bayesian basis for having him on. So I wish you luck. <laughs> Yeah. Does he actually use some Bayes uh, stuff in his work? Because I'm not as familiar as you. Well, it depends on what you call Bayes stuff, right? When we're going to talk about Bayes later in the podcast, I'm guessing we'll talk about Stan and doing applied Bayesian statistics using Bayesian methods for estimation. Now, I don't know how much estimation general does in his work. I imagine not all that much. I don't think of him as much of an empirical person. But, you know, Bayesian updating, the idea of Bayes rule is everywhere in economics. It is the cornerstone of so much of economic theory, and you would find very many references to it if you look at Jean Tirole's work. Oh, that's good. 
Maybe I try for a special IP though. That would be fun. And actually you handed me the perfect segue because I want to ask you actually how Bayesian is the field of IO maybe compared to the other fields in economics. Good. So you might have heard that there is some contestion within economics about which methods to use. And there are people who have very strong feelings one way or another. They often wind up on Twitter and sometimes they fight with Judea Pearl. This is true to some degree. I don't know how representative they are. In fact, I think if you really pay attention to the arguments, they're less against a particular method than in defense of their own as yeah. good enough. But I think a lot of this comes from the questions that people ask. And a prominent feature of I.O., a really structural I.O., this kind of thing that I've described to you, is that I.O. takes the perspective of what question would we like to answer, even if that question mm. is difficult. And the level of comfort with what we would like to answer and what we can't answer is perhaps broader than much of economics. I think a lot mm -hmm. of structural I.O. came from things that might seem kind of heroic to start with. I guess a very famous example is BLP, Barry Levinson Pegas, which is really a paper <laughs> published in 1995. Errol Pegas is one of my advisors, and it presented an algorithm for estimating demand in a market by just observing mm. prices and quantities purchased. Mm -hmm. And what was really amazing about this paper, I mean, it's become incredibly influential. People use it all over the place. It is really an algorithm for something called random coefficients logit, which you might have heard about and is used by a lot of Bayesians. But what was really amazing about it is that it tried to do something kind of heroic, which is to describe how people make substitution choices among a basket of goods when that basket changes. I promise that this will go back to the question that you asked. This is a very canonical part of IO. And so first, what is this thing doing and why is it useful? So this algorithm in 1995 was incredibly innovative. It's still innovative. We still use it. But what was really amazing about it is that it tried to basically trace out a demand curve. The idea is that you observe lots of prices and quantities in equilibrium at a particular point in time, and you want to know what would happen if you change the setting. Now, if you talk to a tech entrepreneur, they'd say the way that I find out what happens if I change my prices or if I change the set of options or whatever it might be is I'll do an A-B test. But if you think a little bit harder, and there's an amazing anecdote that I love from Pat Bayari, the chief economist of Amazon, about why that might not work at scale. It's difficult to try, but the bottom line is pretty easy to imagine, right? It's very difficult to try out every possible combination of options that you might be interested in. And so it might be useful to have a model. But at the time that this was presented, this was really innovative and people met it with a lot of resistance. And one of the, the most amazing parts about it is that economics says that the price and quantity set in equilibrium are where supply meets demand. And so if you can trace out the demand curve, if you can predict how people will change their consumption behavior when you change the option set, then you can also say something about the supply curve, at least the one that you saw on path. And so you can say even more about that. If you have some information about the supply curve, then you can start making inferences about what the marginal cost of the supplier must have been. Now, this is amazing, mm -hmm. right? Like marginal costs mm -hmm. are very private information. And once you know something about marginal costs, you can also start talking about mergers and what the effect of mergers is. And let me just sort of stop by saying that this has become a very influential set of methodology that's been used in like antitrust cases and all over the place. But why am I bringing this up? What does it mean to estimate a firm's marginal cost? Well, you're making some assumptions about things that you can't observe. This isn't an RCT where you observe a treatment effect that's very easy to define. It's really coming from this balance of theory and statistics theory and data that's managed by statistics. And the reason that we do it is not because we're 100% sure that this is right, although there are some amazing stories about you know, marginal costs being well predicted by this thing, but because we think it's important and because we think that we're capturing something that is otherwise hard to capture, but that we can get it in the right direction. Right? Like yeah. We can get an order of magnitude that's sort of accurate. We can learn something about this. If the question is important enough, then maybe that we're willing to do that. Maybe we're willing to say, here's what my model says, and I'll do some robustness checks. I'll see how big the credible interval is, and I'll tell you everything that I can tell you. But that comes from a slightly different perspective than I think a lot of empirical economics has. Right? It sort of says, like, if there's a tool that will help me say something, and the question is important enough, I'm willing to consider it. And so I think there's been a lot more openness to Bayesian methods, even from the beginning of structural IO, at least, to a more openness to the idea that if there's some new methodology, even if we don't really understand it, even if we're not really sure how it relates to the things that we know how to do, if you can argue, if you can convince me that this is letting us learn something important, and you can explain a little bit about how it relates to everything else I know, you can explain what the assumptions are, you can explain what the possible caveats are. And it's okay. And so there's been a lot more room for Bayesian methods because Bayesian methods have facilitated analyses that otherwise would have been much harder, maybe even infeasible. And I think that IO has been you know, relatively open to them. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for this uh, context. <laughs> Very interesting. And yeah, indeed, that also echoes in some part what Cameron Pfeiffer, who works more on the macroeconomics side, told us. So you gave us all this very interesting context about Bayes in I.O., but I'm wondering how you have personally first got introduced to Bayesian methods, because now I think people have an idea of why you use them in your work, but were you introduced to them in math class or more in the I.O. PhD that you did? It's actually a very random story full of coincidences. The sort of two major components, maybe three, depending on how you think of it. The first answer is that in the beginning of grad school, I lived with Rachel Meager, who Bayesian people might be very familiar with. And she started getting into Bayesian stuff, I think, in her second year of grad school. I was hearing a lot about PDA, about Andrew Gelman and the Stan group and all the amazing work that they were doing. And she started working with them a lot. And so I was just sort of around and hearing about it, even though I didn't necessarily know all that much. And then through her, I met Jim Savage, who maybe you're familiar with as well, who at the time was doing a lot of very cool work with Stan and also writing a very fun blog about it. And Jim and I became fast friends. We started talking a lot about the ways in which Bayesian statistics might interact with economics. We wound up talking about BLP, for example, which led to some work on developing a Bayesian approach to random coefficients logit and some work on how to make that efficient and, and how to get the most out of it with Stan. My early interest really came from that interaction, from that friendship. You know, as I got more engaged in the Stan community, the, I think that, you know, there were lots of ways I started seeing ways and times for Bayesian methods to intersect with my work. And so I've used Bayesian estimation for at least parts of a whole bunch of different projects. It's shown up everywhere. I think the biggest example is probably a project on auto insurance, which we can talk about if, you, if you'd like. But that's sort of the story. Yeah. Okay. Funny story. Full of serendipity again. I understand where these come from. And actually, I don't know if it's more the article that you wrote with Jim Savage and Michael Betancourt about large scale random utility legit model you were talking about. I'll put that in the show notes because it's super interesting. I think people will be very willing to read that. And as you said, you work a lot with patient estimation, with Stan in your own modeling. So first, I'm surprised that you're not using Stata, because at least in Europe, like Stata is the software for economics people. It's nice that you're using STEM. So I think something interesting could be that you walk us through an example of a nice Stan uh, slash patient model you did in your work. So it can be the article with James and Michael, but it can also be the auto insurance article you were talking about earlier. It's up to you. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I guess one thing that's worth saying is that Stata is quite popular among economists, but I think you'd find it's significantly less popular among IO economists because mm. a lot of what Stata is really excellent at is making it fairly easy to do very standard kinds of analysis. And a lot of what IO is really doing non-standard analysis. You have to write your yeah. own model because that's sort of the point. And so you need more flexibility. I use Stan and Bayesian methods sort of where appropriate, but I think a lot of the ideology in empirical IO is you should find the right tool to answer your question, right? There are mm -hmm. different kinds of questions mm -hmm. and we're going to be driven by what we want to answer rather than what we can answer with the tools that we have. But Stan is an amazing tool and Bayesian estimation has been really fantastic for certain kinds of problems. And there are a whole bunch of different examples I can give you. Let me talk about the insurance example because I think it's a particularly nice one and it showcases sort of two ways that I use Stan. So let me try to do it this way. First, let me tell you the sort of what the project was about and then maybe some more details about the modeling. So the overarching goal of the project was to look at how monitoring affects choices and behavior. You know, there are programs that are popping up all over the world where insurance companies will track your behavior in some way. Usually it's by giving you some sort of plastic device that you stick in your car. More recently, it's maybe downloading an iPhone app or something like that. Some way that they can see how fast you drive, how fast you accelerate or decelerate, how fast you, how sharply you turn, things like that. Behaviors that they believe are quite correlated with your actual accident rate. And the way that they market it is that you, this is a credible way for you to show them that you're a better driver than they think you are. And, you know, you're a young man. Your baseline rate is probably very high because young men in general are pretty bad drivers. And so if you can convey in a credible way that you're better than the average, you can save a lot of money. And that's a win-win. But in principle, but of course, there are lots of questions. There are questions, for example, about what happens to the people who don't opt in. 
do they get screwed because suddenly they look much worse because all the good people wind up getting this thing in their car? Or do people actually get screwed in a different way where you might not because you're a bad driver, but because you really just don't like the idea of someone watching you? You know, like what are these dynamics in terms of pricing? Who gets price increases? Who gets price decreases? And what does monitoring really do? You know, does it make you a better driver? Or is it just mm-hmm. showing that you already knew, which is that you were better than the average? So this was sort of the overall goal of the project was to try to understand these different forces and separate them out. And the difficulty is that there's a lot of selection, right? Like the reason that you would get this thing in your car is because you think you're a better driver. And so how do we piece that apart? Well, without going too far into the weeds, I'd say that there are sort of two kinds of statistical objects here. One is a purely statistical one. And that's something that we've seen hundreds of models in stand for. Like there's this question of what determines your accident rate? What determines the cost that you will have to this insurance company, given your characteristics, who you are, your age, your income, your education level, whatever other information is, your credit score, maybe. What should we predict as your actual probability of an accident and the cost of that claim? Now, this is a statistical problem. It's an actuarial problem. People have written very many models to try to solve this, including all of the insurance companies. But this is also a Bayesian problem. It is a classical Bayesian problem because, for example, you know, we have many characteristics. You have many different kinds of people. You might imagine there are random effects within person and across people. And this looks really like a statistical process like anything else. It looks, you know, accident rates we typically think of as something like following a Poisson process. Claims rates, people often model as coming from a gamma distribution or something like that. And you might want to model the correlation. And the more you build up this problem, even though it looks like a very simple classical thing, it becomes very complex. And Mm. so Bayesian methods become incredibly powerful to try to estimate it, not to mention that because this is such a well-known problem, you know, we have strong priors. We understand how these things look. So this was the first thing. In order to understand anything, you need to have some understanding of what the underlying distribution of risk is, and that is independent of economics. But it is very much a classic Bayesian problem. There's a separate question, which is that you want to understand the selection problem. You want to understand how people opt into getting this monitoring program, understanding that there are all kinds of things that might stand in the way. For example, why would you want to opt in? You would want to opt in if you think that you'll save money, if you think that you're less risky than your rate suggests, and you think you'll be able to save some. You might not want to opt in for a number of reasons, though. For example, you might not like the idea that someone's tracking you. You might not like to deal with the headache of trying to figure out what this program is, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's some sort of inertia cost to making a change or, or making a decision. There are all kinds of things that might go into play. And so the goal of modeling here is to put all of these ideas in a simple form into a choice framework or a utility framework. And so the idea is that there's a whole bundle of pieces of information that might cause you to prefer to choose a particular insurance product or not. Part of that is the statistical object, which is your actual risk, which we have a lot of information about because it's determined by the statistical process. Part of it is also all of these other things that we can think of as maybe manifestations of a random variable. Depending Mm -hmm. on who you are, you might have more or less disutility from this idea that someone's tracking you, for example. Yeah. And so we characterize these in terms of your characteristics, and we say that you are more likely to choose a particular plan if you like it more, summing everything up. And so if we observe you choosing a plan, this is really the main sort of what we would call identifying assumption. If we observe you choosing a particular plan, it must be because you liked it more. There are a number of things that might have caused you to like it. Most of them are structural, though. Most of them are tied to (laughs) physical, in quotes, objects that we understand. And then maybe there's a bit of random error that has some variance term. At a high level, what we're doing is we're trying to estimate what these objects are. Basically, you know, how much are you worried about your risk? How much are you worried about being tracked? <laughs> or, you know, like all of the things that really just determine whether you opt into monitoring or not. How averse are you to switching the plan that you were on before? All of these things are, we think of as random variables that are drawn from a hierarchical distribution depending on your observable characteristics. And really, that's all of it. We take this model. It's a very complicated model. It has very many parameters because we want to capture the fact that people are very different. And you might imagine everybody having an individual random effect in many different ways. And so we wanted to have a model that is able to capture all of that while still capturing the hierarchical relationship that helps us understand what these distributions are rather than just treating every data point as a separate thing. I don't know if I've done it justice, but the idea is that you take this very large process and you estimate it jointly with the statistical one. And being able to Mm. estimate them jointly is incredibly powerful. And it's something that's very difficult to do outside the Bayesian framework. Stan is quite incredible in that it allows us to do this. But what that gives you, you can think about it as estimating the joint likelihood of your risk distribution, given who you are, Mm. and the choices that you made, which are, of course, deeply informed by your risk distribution. Mm. 
Okay. So basically, did you have like two models or did you have one model with like two likelihood distributions? I don't know what you mean by a model. In some sense, there are lots of different models that interact with each other, right? You can think of the statistical model as a separate thing, but it's estimated jointly, right? Like when you compute your log likelihood, you sum up all the likelihoods together. Yeah. And of course, the results, right? The parameters that characterize the statistical distribution are also parameters of the economic model because of this key relationship. Mm -hmm. And so you get a lot more precision in your understanding of exactly what drove a particular choice. Another one, and that lets you say something about selection. It lets you say something about how people would respond if, for example, you took away monitoring. Yeah, that's seen one of the interesting parts of the Bayesian framework. It's generative, so you can think about these kind of scenarios. So you said that you use several characteristics, I think, to evaluate people's willingness to self-select, basically, for the program. So I'm curious, which characteristics did you have in mind, like a priori? And then once you ran the analysis, were you surprised a posteriori by the characteristics that the model found the most important or were they in line with your priors? So there's not going to be a very clean answer. Let me try to give you some sort of aggregate summaries that might go in the direction of what you're asking about. So rather than saying what drives selection into monitoring, let me talk about something that's very important in that, which is this idea that you don't like being monitored because you just don't like being monitored. And this is an important thing because you might imagine that if there are a substantial number of people who are good drivers, but don't opt in because they don't like this idea or because of some other, we call them frictions, right? We don't necessarily know exactly what's driving this. It's really just the reason holding everything else fixed that you wouldn't do it. You might imagine that they would really lose out because they would get a much higher rate. They could be paying significantly less for their insurance, but they're not because of this utility term. And so one of the things that we looked at is, you know, we estimated this utility term for each person and we looked at what seems to characterize that. And we found a whole bunch of things. One of the things that we found is just that there's really a lot of heterogeneity in this utility from being monitored. Mm -hmm. But there are a couple of things that seem to correlate. Can you translate in non-economic terms <laughs> what having a lot of heterogeneity means? Yeah, well, a lot of heterogeneity just means if you look at just the percentiles. So one way that we characterize this utility, because we're in economics land, we can put dollar terms on it. And when I say put dollar terms on it, I mean, you know, how much money would you need to be given or what discount on your premium would you need to be given in order to convince you to change your behavior? That's a really nice, easy to interpret kind of thing. And so you can talk about this utility in terms of dollars or, or percentage of the original premium. And before I talk about heterogeneity, I should say that we found that there's a substantial amount of monitoring this utility. This seems to be a really salient thing that there are a lot of people who don't opt in to monitoring because they don't like mm -hmm. to, even though they would benefit from doing so. And in dollar terms, the average amount that monitoring seems to cost people in mental, emotional costs is $93, which is about 12% of premium. Mm -hmm. But when I say there's a lot of heterogeneity, what I mean is that the standard deviation is really quite large, relatively speaking. So the standard deviation is $19, which is 19 out of 93. And if you look at the range, this utility ranges from you know, $10 to almost 200, 287. Yeah. Okay. So this means that people vary a lot in their aversion to monitoring. And some people are so averse to monitoring that you would need to discount their premium by $200 for them to consider opting to the program. Exactly. That's exactly right. And there's heterogeneity. There's some information on who exactly is opting in and who isn't. So for example, people who have more private risk, people who are more expensive to begin with, seem to also have higher monitoring this utility, which is quite interesting. Uh, yeah, which is quite also counterintuitive. You would think that if they have more private risks, they would be willing to enroll in a program that could lower their costs or well, stuff like that. Well, not necessarily. In principle, if you have higher risk, it means you might have less to benefit from monitoring. What's interesting here is that we're capturing as monitoring this utility is after accounting for the fact that they have higher risk. So it's in addition to the fact that they have less to benefit from, less mm -hmm. to gain from joining in, they also seem to have higher aversion to monitoring, even holding that fixed, even accounting yeah. for that, which I'm not even sure if it's intuitive or counterintuitive. I can come up with stories either way. I could, you yeah, could say yeah. that, you know, there's more uncertainty or, you know, you're more angry about it. I don't know. You can come yeah, up with lots yeah. of stories, but that's why it's an interesting question, right? I don't have a clear mm -hmm. intuition over what direction that should go in. And this tells me mm -hmm. a lot about what the underlying process is.
We can see other things. We can see, for example, that surprisingly older, more educated drivers seem to be less averse and seem to have a lower monitoring risk, which we can also sort of rationalize. We can say, you know, maybe they understand the process more, they're more confident that monitoring will actually reveal what, what they think it will. But again, I, I could come up with a story that goes in the other direction too. And then, so this was very interesting. Yeah, this is super interesting. Okay. We definitely got to have to put this paper in the show notes for people to refer to. And I'm guessing that there are a lot more details about the model in the paper. And maybe is the model available somewhere on a GitHub repo or something like that? Yeah, absolutely. So I don't think we've posted the model on GitHub right now while we're doing the revision process, but we certainly will at the very least when the paper is published, probably sooner. Yeah, perfect. Because I'm guessing that some people in the audience want to have a look at this very complicated model. <laughs> so uh, definitely a good thing. It sounds like a very complicated model, but in many ways, a lot of the ideas behind the choice framework came from the work on the random coefficient logic. Ultimately, the choice model is quite similar, right? It's just mm -hmm. that rather than having products, you have insurance plans. Mm. I didn't come up with the discrete choice framework, but my work with Jim, for example, was very helpful in the beginning of this project. And I think a lot of the ideas corresponded. So when reading, you know, the blog post, you can imagine how some of the things that I've described fit in just like that. Perfect. So the blog post will be in the show notes, as I said, so that's good. That will complement everything. Did you have any other surprise in the results of the model? Like you were talking about this utility function for the monitoring process. Were there other interesting results or maybe interesting non-results in the sense that you expected that something would be important in the whole process, but it turned out you can't really be sure whether it's important or not. What were your other surprises, if any? So I wouldn't frame those as surprises. We did a lot of thinking about how to use this choice framework. One of the big questions that we had in doing this was to imagine, try to understand what the value of monitoring is and how monitoring can be sustained in other regulatory frameworks. One of the things we found, which I wouldn't call surprising, but it's quite interesting, is that being monitored seems to have a pretty big effect on your probability of an accident. Mm -hmm. And you don't need a Bayesian framework to show you that. You can even see that in a reduced form with a, a diff and diff and diff. <laughs> if you just compare how people drive before and after they're monitored. I guess I forgot a key part of the story is that in our data set, people are only monitored for the first six months uh, mm -hmm. of their relationship with insurer. And so you can compare the first six months and afterwards for people who opt in and people who don't. And you can see very viscerally that there's a big difference. And so it seems like monitoring itself produces a big value. That's sort of one of the major things we find. Monitoring seems to create a lot of value to everybody. And that value gets split between consumers, between drivers and the insurance company as a function of a lot of things, in part as a function of the amount of competition. And so a big focus point of the economic analysis is how important that competition is important both in terms of distributing welfare between drivers and, and insurance company, but also in terms of making sure that the insurance company makes some profit and a profit to warrant doing this big program, which involves, among other things, incentives to just get drivers to sign up in terms of yeah. fairly large discounts. You can think of this as a big investments that the company makes in order to facilitate mm -hmm. this whole thing. And there's not enough profit that it might not be worth it to do it. So this is a major part of the reasoning in the paper. But one unsatisfying thing about the current paper And the current work is that we can see that monitoring has a big impact, but it's hard for us to tell why exactly. Mm -hmm. We weren't able to see the underlying data behind what happens under monitoring, only an aggregate score that the company produced. And you might imagine that there's a lot of very interesting stuff going on. How do people respond to direct incentives? For example, how much do they care about the effect of a particular incident on their monitoring score? And how actually do they get better? And maybe more importantly, is the extent to which they become better? Is that something that you have to keep incentivizing? Do you need to keep monitoring them and giving them discounts month after month or year after year? Or can you just teach them once and then they become better? I think that's a very crucial question that we don't have the answer to. But I think that there are other projects that are starting to look at this. We've thought about it a little bit too. And that's less of a surprise and more just a very striking question that I'd love to know more about. Yeah, definitely. So to go back to one of the important findings of this project, which is like big aversion to monitoring, this exactly reminds me of something going on right now, at least in France. I don't know for the US, but basically the French government developed an app, which is called Stop COVID, to tell you when you encounter people who have then been flagged with having been infected to COVID and then the app can suggest you quarantine for two weeks and so on, but it's just information. 
So it's like huge aversion to this app because of the monitoring part, you know, like mainly people freaking out. I'm going to be followed by the free service or stuff like that. And the result is that in the end, the app has only been downloaded by, I think, between two or three million people in a country of 60 million people. So you can easily guess that it's basically useless to have an app used only by two or three million people. So I'm wondering, and tell me if you're uncomfortable answering this question, because I know it's not really a research question because you didn't have all that time to, you know, develop a model and think about that. It's more in the a hot take, but I'm wondering how, you know, the findings of your paper about aversion monitoring, do you think are transferable to other situations like exactly this one that I talked about in France? And And also, importantly, what would then be your ideas, your recommendations for, well, reassuring people? Because a lot of people being developers and so on in France said that, you know, this app is quite secure. It's using like open source security protocols that are state of the art, that are a lot better than a lot of the apps you have on your iPhones and Androids. This app is a lot less invasive than a lot of apps you already have on your phones. And it didn't make a dent, apparently, in people's behavior. So I'm really wondering about how we could then reassure people in the end. So obviously, there are a few caveats, one of which is that, you know, there are very different kinds of issues that people might have with Mm -hmm. having something that tracks them when they're walking with their phone rather than when they're driving in their car. And when they're being tracked for, you know, a health-related thing that might cause them to be quarantined rather than, you know, like a change on their insurance premiums. So we're talking about pretty different stakes. But that said, I think that there are some things we could learn. One of the things is that it seems like, given the extent of the monitoring, this utility, even for this insurance, auto insurance thing, If we think about it in dollar terms, which again, like we estimate a fairly large number of dollar terms, one of the ways that we interpret our results is that the insurance company has to spend a significant amount of money to get people to download and use it. And so there are some sort of practical things about this. So one of the things that that came to my mind when you were talking is that it probably helps to have an invested party that is liable to legislation and to, to legal process if something goes wrong. I think people are much more willing to trust a single company that has a reputation than they are random app developers somewhere whom they don't know. Maybe I would trust the government. I don't know if everybody else would. But even with the trust, it's not clear that the trust is really the only issue. Part of the issue is also that people just don't like being tracked. But at least in some context, they're willing to accept some amount of money in exchange for being tracked. Like money is a convenient transferring tool. There are other ways that you can get people to want to use your thing, right? You can give them social incentives. You can make it fun. You can create utility in in many ways. But I think maybe what we're finding is that the value of downloading this app really is maybe not high enough by itself. Maybe either people don't care or they don't trust that everybody else will download it. And if everybody else doesn't download it, then it's not useful. Yeah. One solution is to try to create value outside of the canonical use case. Maybe that would Mm -hmm. work. Okay, I love this answer. That's typically an economist answer, but I I love that. (laughs) And what I mean by that, it's not uh, negative in my tone. I didn't even think of these economic incentives when thinking about that. People exchange their privacy for things that they like all the time, right? And it's sort of, we're we're asking people to be very altruistic here and maybe we don't have to. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And also adding to that, like kind of the prisoner's dilemma, which is like, oh, I know I should download the app, but I won't do it if not everybody does it. So if I'm the only one to do it, I'm the only one to be tracked and I don't want that. So I don't download it. So my neighbor is not doing it either. My boyfriend is not doing it either. So it's really compounded interest and disinterest, you know. (laughs) And actually, it's a super good segue for one of the last questions I want to ask you, because I saw you were currently working on a project about socioeconomic network heterogeneity and pandemic policy response. So first, I have to say it's a very poetic name. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we tried to come up with something better, but there are so many people on the team that (laughs) you have to go for the least common denominator. And this is, we thought at least this one was descriptive. Yeah, you can see that it's like super descriptive and that there is like every adjective in the title. So kidding aside, it seems like it's a particularly timely project. What can you tell us about it and how IO can help dealing with the pandemic? Yeah, so I, I don't know how canonically IO this is, but the gist of the project is that 
there's a big question that, that a lot of people were asking, which is how will different reopening policies affect the spread of the pandemic? And if you look, especially in the first few months after COVID started, there were a lot of papers coming out with different versions of this SIR style model. But the thing about the SIR model is that while very powerful, it really operates at a very aggregate level. It's a function of the number of people who are infected today and also the number of people who could be exposed and the rate of infection upon meeting each other. But this is really a very aggregate thing and it's hard to break down. It's hard to say, you know, what does it mean for the infection rate, for example, or the number of exposures if we open restaurants or something like that? And so what we did, and this was also, you know, a project of serendipity. There were a lot of, of different parts that came together that I'll spare you the story for. But essentially, what we tried to do is to connect this with data using a, a very nice and unique source of data about underlying contacts and where they happen. And so the main data source that we use is essentially a synthetic population by this company called Replica. So Replica is a transportation company. They collect data from basically GPS things from a whole mm -hmm. array of different sources. I guess they're not all GPS. If you've heard of SafeGraph, that's a particular type of cell phone ping where basically your cell phone interacts, it has a bunch of apps that track your location, or at least can track your location for a variety of purposes, some of which you asked for and some of which maybe you didn't, but you give permission for. And they ping your phone intermittently at some random process that they operate and then send that to an aggregator. That aggregator might then send, sell those GPS pings in a de-identified, at least in principle, de-identified way to a variety of companies, uh, including Replica. And then those companies often use this data to give tools to cities and municipalities or companies that are trying to do some sort of planning involving movement patterns. There are a bunch of other types of data sources involved too. You know, I don't, I don't want to spend too much time on it. But I guess the bottom line is that there are a whole bunch of different, you can think of as signals of how people are moving and where people go that have different kinds of data issues, but that together build a pretty good picture of, of what the city looks like. And what Replica does is it takes all of them together and puts them into a single model that creates a synthetic population that looks like the population of a city. So for example, in a city like Chicago, rather than having a data set of actual people with their actual locations, it'll have a data set of people, you know, the same number of people that actually live in Chicago, each of whom has a work location, a set of characteristics, you know, a place where they live, a place where they work. And movement patterns that in total mimic the movement patterns that are seen in the data. And so all of these moments, if you take different snapshots of the synthetic population, they'll look exactly like the real population. And it'll be predictive, for example, of, you know, how many cars will be on this bridge at this time of day. But none of the people in a synthetic data set will actually match a real person. And so there's a level of privacy that's attached. And I would say there's sort of two benefits, one of which is the privacy, but the other is that it's really aggregating a lot of different data sets that in principle are, are hard to connect and they've done this work. But what's really nice for us, the reason that we were very excited about working with them, at least for this project, is that by seeing where people go and where they spend their time, so you can imagine a data a subset of the data set for a particular person as saying, you know, between nine and 10, he went here and he stayed in this restaurant, he had had lunch. And then afterwards he went to his workplace and he, this workplace is looking at this other place and this is how much time he spent there. And then he went to take a coffee and whatever. You see where everyone was, each one of these synthetic people was at every point in time on an average day. And then you can ask the question, invert it a little bit and say, how much time do people spend together in each place, mm -hmm. right? Because what we care about for infection is contacts. In principle, contact is something like, you know, being within six feet of each other or something like that. We definitely can't observe that, at least on a consistent basis. But what we can say is that if you were in the same room, with some probability you interacted and that interaction was necessary to happen in order for you to be infected. Mm -hmm. And so we took this synthetic data set and we produced a graph of contact that said for each place, how many people of different characteristics, first of all, you know, the raw data set, how many people in general interacted with. And so each interaction is, you know, you and I went to Starbucks and we spent uh, an hour in Starbucks and this is our contact. From then, what we want to do is we wanted to connect this with the SAR model and with different reopening policies. And so we took this data set that's basically based on first quarter of 2019. We were trying to say something about what this is sort of a, an example of what the full economy might look like before COVID, if COVID were not a thing. And then you introduce COVID. And the way that you introduce COVID is you say, okay, let's take this graph of contacts and to make it a little bit more tractable with the SIR model, there's a, an extension of the SIR model that is based on an aggregate contact matrix. So I, I should say, there are a couple of different ways that you can do this. One way is to try to simulate the pandemic spread across this giant graph of people. But, you know, simulating epidemiological spreads on a graph of 20 million people is not very tractable. And so we scrapped that idea very quickly. And we went to this idea of using contact matrices, which is something that's been used a little bit more and more in SIR frameworks, but not nearly enough because data on contact matrices is really just hard to get. And if you look, the state of the art is often, you know, quite crude and based on aggregates of data from different places and different times that are hard to make sense of. But we can do this. And so we take our graph 
And we say, how many people of each, let's say, age group met and for how long? What is the average amount of contact between the people who are 18 to 25? And then you can make it more granular. How many contacts were there between people who are of age 25, one of whom worked in manufacturing and the second of whom worked in healthcare? Mm. who might have different levels of exposure. And we have a couple yeah. of more categories like this, but we basically build this large matrix of contacts and we can input that into an SIR model and estimate what would happen. And in particular, we can estimate the parameters that rationalize the death rates that we see under the SIR framework with our contacts. Mm-hmm. But of course, there are a few things here that are important, which is that if you want to model the pandemic spread during COVID, of course, we didn't operate under a full economy, you know, as soon, at least in the U.S., in major cities like Chicago, at least, as soon as it became clear that COVID hit, there was a, basically a shelter-in-place lockdown type of policy that was instated so that only essential workers were allowed to go to work and everybody else was encouraged to stay home. So how do we account for that? It's really nice because we have the underlying graph that's already tagged with workplaces and we know what each of these mm-hmm. contacts looks like. And so we say, you know, under a shelter-in-place, nobody's going to restaurants anymore because restaurants are closed. So any contact that would have happened in a restaurant no longer exists. Similarly, you know, if you worked in an office building, if you work at Google, you no longer go to your workplace, you stay at home. And so anyone you might've met while you were at Google, you no longer meet. And we can input this into the SIR model again. And what's really nice about that is that then we can talk about counterfactual policies. You know, when we did this originally, it was still May. And so we didn't know at all what would happen. And so what we wanted to do is to evaluate what different kinds of reopenings might look like, where reopening might be, for example, you know, keep shelter in place, keep everybody, only essential workers out, or alternatively, do like an alternating schedule where half of the workers go in on a particular day and half go on another day. And so the number of total contacts are cut. You know, that's one kind of policy. We also had other questions. So one of the policies that people were talking about a lot in the beginning is force anybody who's over 60 who might be particularly susceptible to the disease to stay at home. So that's another kind of thing we can do. We just say, you know, if you're over 60, you're not allowed to have any contacts outside of going to the pharmacy or some, some basic essentials. And so what we do is take our graph for any policy that you might be curious about, simulate what would happen in terms of the contact. So shut down any contacts that aren't allowed and simulate the SIR process going forward to see what would happen in terms of infections and deaths. And one of the really interesting things, I guess, the thing that makes us economics and not just epidemiology is that a thing that we paid a lot of attention to is what would happen to employment. And so a very nice data set that we used in large part, thanks to Simon Mungi, who had done a bunch of work on this before we started working together, is to incorporate surveys on the ability to work from home. Essentially, a major question, if everyone is forced to stay home, there's a question of whether they're able to continue to work productively. You know, I can work pretty productively on my research without going into the office, but, you know, somebody who works in manufacturing probably can't do that. And depending on your job, depending on your industry, you'll have a different probability. And so what this data set allowed us to do is to tag, basically encode the probability that any person in our synthetic population is able to work from home productively. And so rather than Mm. just saying all these people stay at home, there'll be less infections. And this is a fraction of people who won't be able to work. And so they'll contribute to unemployment. They'll have more days of unemployment and as a consequence have a negative impact on the economy. It also lets us answer a really interesting question, which is maybe more relevant than, you know, should we send everybody to work or not? Because probably we won't get that. A relevant question is what would happen if only people who had to go into work were sent to work and anyone who could continue working productively at home, like me, Mm. continued to do that. That's substantially less than the whole population going into work. And you might imagine it would be better. And one of the things that we found that was kind of striking is that this basically does almost better than anything else that you can try. This work from home, if possible, Mm. is quite good. And it gets you a lot of the way to where you want to go in terms of reducing or not, and also has a much smaller impact on the economy than even alternating schedules, but certainly less so than like a full shelter in place type of policy. Yeah, I see. Well, fascinating project. And indeed, the way you were explaining it, I was exactly thinking about this counterfactual analysis possibility that you have with this project. So that's really amazing. Is there somewhere where we can see the results of this analysis at their website? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So first of all, there's a paper, but one thing that I would definitely encourage you to do is, so just yesterday, we posted a website called reopenmappingproject.com. And if you go, then you can see we built a nice interactive GUI where you can try different kinds of policies. So you can say, you know, what would happen if you do remote if possible? What would happen if you do alternating schedules for work? But also you can see, you know, what is the effect of forcing old people to stay at home? What is the effect of having more caution or less caution? I wrote a tweet thread actually explaining what all these things mean. And you can see this not just for Chicago, but also for, you know, the pandemic come earlier or later. And you'll see wearing masks is helpful no matter where you are. 
but the extent of the savings, the extent of the differences really varies by place. And so oh, yeah. I would really encourage you to go and check out the website. I think it has a nice explanation. And then there's a lot more detail in the paper, which is also linked there. Yeah, I'm on it right now. And this looks super interesting. It looks fascinating. It's uh, for four city for now, right? Chicago, Kansas City, New York City, Sacramento. And it's saying that more cities are coming soon. Exactly. So. Yeah, I should say we did this in two ways. The main way is, is with the replica data set that I told you about. But you can also do this with publicly available data from this organization called Fred. And they do a similar thing in the sense that you can generate from their data synthetic population and build contact matrices, similarly to what we did mm -hmm. with replica. The data itself comes from a, a range of things, including census statistics, but also interviews and surveys from a range of different countries. And so it's not quite as localized and precise and interesting in some sense as, as the replica data, but it gives you surprisingly similar results. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing is that you can build it for any place you want in the US. And we also posted all of our code on GitHub together with the website. So you can go and see exactly how we did it. You can do it for any state, any county that you want. And another thing is that our work in some sense takes contact matrices as an input. And so if you have a set of contact matrices from, you know, someplace in France, for example, you can see exactly how we formatted and how we did it. You can input your own contact matrices and run everything yourself. And so we, mm. hope, we hope people do this and play with it. Yeah, okay. So you could generalize that, for instance, if you had a contract matrix from Paris and do the same kind of analysis and run the model for Paris, for instance. Exactly. And one thing to add, I guess, since this is a podcast about Bayesian methods and STEM, is that we, the way that we're doing our estimation right now is not in the Bayesian framework, not because we didn't want to, but just because we wanted to do one thing at a time. And our focus was really on being able to use the contact matrices together with everything else. But it's very much on our agenda. And I think that it would be very interesting to see how much precision you can get and how much adding accounting for all the uncertainty and the measurements and death counts and things like that might yeah. really result. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You work also on pricing mechanisms, and I wanted to ask you some questions about that, but we don't have time anymore. <laughs> Let's go to the last two questions I ask every guest at the end of the show. The first one is, if you had unlimited time and resources, which problem would you try to solve? Yeah, to be honest, I don't know that there's any problem that I'd want to solve, but I don't feel like I have the time and resources to try to solve now. I think I'm very excited about the work that I'm doing, and I haven't found anything yet that's my golden goose. But maybe that's okay. Maybe, maybe every problem is yeah. a golden goose. Yeah, yeah. That's actually a good sign, I think. Mm -hmm. Second question then is, if you could have dinner with any great scientific mind, dead, alive, or fictional, who would it be? Yeah, I thought a bit about this question. And in this moment with all the thinking and really reevaluation of historical figures that we have, if I think very carefully, I think a lot of especially dead and older great scientific minds that I could think about, I'm not sure how welcoming they would be of me. As a person, you know, in some sense, the fact that I am, you know, a young woman in academia with the access to doing the kind of work that I'm doing, not just the work, but also the, you know, this platform is quite amazing in this historical moment. And so more so than actually getting to interview someone really incredible and maybe worrying about what they might think of me, I think what I'd really like is to meet one of the early female pioneers, you know, Mary Curie or some of the early women in computing, just to tell them that I'm here. And I think they'd be pretty excited to know. Yeah. Definitely. Inspiring answer. Okay, well, Shosh, thank you very much. It was really great learning about IO. Turns out I really love IO and I'm really into these topics. I already love game theory related to elections and so on, but these topics were really super interesting, but insurance pricing and the world of econ in general. So it's great to hear that patient tools are helpful in so many different fields. So congrats again on all these amazing projects. As usual, I'll put resources and a link to your website in the show notes for those who want to dig deeper. Thank you again, Shosh, for taking the time and being on this show. Thank you, Alex. This was great. This has been another episode of Learning Bayesian Statistics. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher and visit learnbasestats.envol.app for more resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes that will help you reach true Bayesian state of mind. That's learnbasestats.envol.app. Our theme music is Good Bayesian by Baba Brinkman, Fit MC Lars, and Mega Ram. Check out his awesome work at bababrinkman.com. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country. You can support the show and unlock exclusive benefits by visiting patreon.com slash stats. 
Thanks so much for listening and for your support. You're truly a good baby. Change your predictions after taking information. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Let me show you how to be a good baby. Change calculations after taking fresh data. Those predictions that your brain is making, let's get them on a solid foundation.